right. Praise the Lord. Welcome to church. Amen. Welcome to the church building. We're not, I'm not in the parsonage. I'm in the church building. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. So uh, let's stand in our feet. If you're able to stand, grab your hymn book to page 10. Very easy to find, page 10. Near the cross, Facebook friends, welcome also. We thank you for joining us also. So uh, page 10, near the cross. I love it because here near the cross, you know who wrote this, who penned down these words? Fanny Crosby. A lot, a lot of us know about Fanny Crosby, right? Fanny Crosby went through some, some, some um, difficult times. Fanny Crosby was uh, blind from birth. The doctor uh, put the wrong drops in her eyes. She became blind, and she kept her spirit up. She was blind all her life, and she, she wrote hundreds of hymns. And this is one of the hymns that she wrote about near the cross. I love it. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. So this is very encouraging, especially from Fanny Crosby. And we need to follow her example. We need to stay near the cross, near Christ. Anybody excited about the Lord? Anybody? Can I get an amen? Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Good to see, to see my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. So praise the Lord. So let's grab your hymn book and let's sing. Let's sing unto the Lord. Let's bring him honor and glory tonight. Page 10, near the cross. Golden 
strand just beyond the river in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river amen please remain standing for the reading of god's word which is in the book of colossians in chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 looking at verses 2 through 6 Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2, the scripture reads, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. Please be seated. All right. The Lord, you hear me well? Amen. I was thinking of that song, Near the Cross, from Fanny Crosby. And it was talking about rest, finding rest in your soul. And I thought of Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest is only found in Christ, my the whole world could be in full of turmoil and fear and stress and anxiety, but we as God's people, we have rest in our soul because of Jesus. Amen? Because that's why we must maintain a sweet fellowship, sweet intimacy with Christ. Amen? Tonight... Good to, be, good to be here. Miss you all. Amen. Good to be back. Good to be healthy. Praise the Lord. Amen. And by the way, I'm still excited about the Lord. Amen. I hope you're still excited about the Lord. The Lord has not disappointed you. We disappoint him. Come on now. That's right. God is good. Amen. Right, Carmen? God is good. How's your father doing? Praise the Lord. That's the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him. Anyway, tonight I want to talk to you about how to be an effective witness. How to be an effective witness. And we need to uh, uh, want to be a more effective witness for the Lord. That's why we're here. That's the reason why we're not in heaven yet. If God saved you just to take you out of heaven, then why are you still here? If that's the reason, is it still on? If that's the reason why we're, if he's able just to take us to heaven, then why are we still here? That's not the main reason. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for heaven. Thank God that saved people got an assurance of a home in heaven, but that's the reason, I think the reason we're here is so we could, we could be a witness for Christ, so we could point others to Jesus. So that's why I want to talk to you tonight about how to be an effective witness so let's pray father we thank you for your goodness thank you for church thank you for this time that we set aside lord for the most important part of the service the preaching of your word lord wonderful words of life beautiful words of life and you tell us jesus in matthew 4 4 that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of god we have every word in the king james bible from genesis to revelation we don't live by feeling, by emotions. We don't live by fear. We live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. 
And thank you that we're about to study some of those words, Lord. Help me to be a blessing. Help me to be an encouragement. And Lord, help us to be a more effective witness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read to you a poem that is fit into the text that Brother Jerry led us in reading on Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 and 6, which is our text. But let me read to you a poem that I think is fitting to the text about being an effective witness. And this is a, a poem written by a guy named Paul Gilbert. And he says this, he says, You're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do, by the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Tell me, what is the gospel? according to you. So that's my question tonight. What is the gospel according to you? What is the gospel according to you? You know, there's an evangelist who's been there for many years. He was, uh, uh, maybe some of you heard of him, evangelist Gypsy Smith. Anybody ever heard of evangelist Gypsy Smith? Well, he said that he was a powerful preacher. This is 1800s maybe. He's been with the Lord for so many years. But he said this, he said there are five Gospels. He said there are five Gospels. He said you got the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the fifth Gospel is the Christian. But he said most people never read the first four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they read the fifth one, which is your life, the Christian. And I, I do like that because the Bible does tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 2, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So in other words, you and I are a walking Bible. You and I are a walking Bible. You and I are a walking advertisement for Jesus. And we need to be a good advertisement for Jesus, not a bad, lousy advertisement for Jesus. Because all of us are, we're walking Bible. We are. What is the gospel according to you? Are you living Christ in the home? Are you living Christ in the job? Are you living Christ outside of your job? Are you making the gospel look attractive by your life? Do others know that you love Jesus? That's my question to you tonight. Do others know that you love Jesus? Do others see Christ shining through you? Are you an effective witness for Jesus? Am I an effective witness for Jesus? And that's what Paul is talking about in our text in Colossians chapter 4, in verses 2 and 6, how to be an effective witness. And I want you to notice, if you got your Bible open, we should keep our Bibles open, I want you to notice in Colossians chapter 4, our text, there's a key verse which I want you to look at, and it's in verse 5, Colossians chapter 4, in verse 5, let me show you that key verse. It's on verse 5. It says, walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Now, that's the key verse. It says there, towards them. You were supposed to walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Who is that? Who's he talking about to them that are without? I believe he's talking to the unbelieving world, those outside of the church. He's talking about the outsiders that are not Christians. Paul is talking about walking wisely before the unsaved world, making the gospel look attractive. You know why? They're watching us. We are a walking Bible. We are a walking advertisement for Jesus Christ. And we must walk wisely before the Unsaved world, always making the gospel look attractive. Why? Remember when I give you the poem, I started off with the poem, that we are writing a gospel chapter each day by day by our deeds, by our words, and men read while you write. What is the gospel according to you? What is the gospel according to you? So people are observing. Look, they might not, they might not read. How many of you gave out gospel tracts? Look at a lot of hand. Praise the Lord. Keep spreading the word. Amen. Keep spreading it. Amen. So uh, uh, we got tracks over there in the little hallway there. Grab some and uh, 
keep the gun loaded and keep spreading the gospel. But you know, everybody that you get the gospel track, we, we, we expect them, we want them to read it, right? But not everybody's going to read it. There's times, thank God you don't see too many of them, but there's times that I have been out soul winning and I see some of our gospel tracks on the floor. Not many of them, praise the Lord. I can't even count my one, with, with my one hand. But I suddenly, and I, if, if it looks clean and it's not full of mud, I grab it. And I put it in my pocket. I said, that's not nice what you just did. But not everybody that you give the gospel track is going to read it. Some might reject it. I, I'm thinking of my mom. Mrs., her and Mrs. Thomas years ago. Remember Mrs. Thomas? That, that, that was, uh, they were the soul winning team that would go out. Her and my mom used to go out faithfully soul winning Mrs. Thomas. And I remember my mother told me a story where she, gave, she was Mrs. Thomas. She would give, try to give out a gospel track, and the person grabbed the gospel track with a stern face, and then he took a, pulled out a lighter and, 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 and turned the lighter on and took the gospel track and set it on fire right in front of Mrs. Thomas in my mom's hand. <laughs> Not everybody's going to read the track that you give them, but they read your life. Then I'm, they might not read the gospel track, but guess what? They are reading your life because you are a walking advertisement for Jesus. You are a walking track. They're watching you. So we as Christ followers have a responsibility to be an effective witness. We have a responsibility to be an effective witness for Christ. And this new year, that should be our goal. I, wanna, I want God to multiply my effectiveness as an so I could be a more effective witness for Christ. How can we be an effective witness before an unbelieving world? Well, we're supposed to walk wisely, he tells us, before those that are without, the outsiders. So how can we become a faithful witness before an unbelieving world? I believe in our text, there's six ways to do that in our text. I saw six things that I want to give you tonight that will encourage us. Uh, uh, six characteristics here. For us, that we need to put to practice in order for us to be an, an effective witness for the Lord this new year. Number one, let me just jump on it right away. Number one, we're supposed to pray purposely. Pray purposely. We need to pray with purpose. We cannot be an effective witness if we don't learn to pray with purpose. Someone say this. Someone say this. Before we, before we speak to man for God, we must speak to God for man. And that is so important. Let me tell you how you should pray. Let me break it down from our text. How do we pray purposely? Well, we need to pray continually, I believe, with perseverance. Notice in Colossians chapter 4, in verse 2, it says, continue in prayer. Do you see that? Continue in prayer. It means to devote time and attention and strength to the tax of prayer. That's what that means. It has the idea to be strong in your prayer life. God does not want us to give up on prayer. We have to be strong in our prayer life. That's what we need to do, step up our prayer life. We got to be strong in our prayer life. That's why he means continuing prayer. It means to pray continually with persevering. It means to devote time and attention and strength to the task of prayer, to be strong in your prayer life, God does not want us to give up on prayer. At times, when we pray for unsaved loved ones, many times we give up. How many of you have unsaved loved ones that you have been praying for them? Let me see your hand. Look, a lot of hands. Keep praying. Many times we have said, Pastor, I know I hear that a lot, but I have been praying for years. Nothing happened yet. Keep praying. Keep praying. Amen? Many times we just give up. We give up too fast. We're praying for unsaved loved ones. We give up because they never get saved. And the more I pray for them, it looks like the worse they get. It looks like the worse they get. We give up praying. We, we got to keep praying, my friend. I think, I think of a guy named in the 1800. His name was George Mueller. You ought to read a biography about George Mueller. He was a, 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 an evangelist, George Mueller. And George Mueller was known for his persevering in prayer. He was a man of prayer. And you know that George Mueller, when I read his biography years ago, George Mueller one day began to pray for five of his friends' salvation. He began, specifically five of his friends, he began to pray all his life for five of his friends to be saved. 
After many months, one got saved. After many months, one got saved. Ten years later, another one got saved. Actually, two more got saved ten years later. And then 20 years later, another one got saved. Now you got four saved. But that's, that's, 30, that's 30 years, 30 years and many months. And then four got saved. And then now he got one more that he was praying for, the fifth one. He kept praying on his life, and then he died. And he didn't get saved yet. But then after George Mueller died, he got saved. Amen? So look, that's, that's what, and, and he was known to be a man who persevered in prayer. George Mueller prayed. I mean, he, 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 uh, he didn't give up on prayer. He devoted his time and attention and strength to the task of prayer. He was strong in prayer. And that's what we need to do. We want to be effective witness. And we need to pray for church grow. Amen? Pray for church grow and keep praying until the light breaks through. We need to pray that God will give us labors. Amen? Keep praying. We need to pray that God will give us fruit that remains. Hey, we got fruit that remains here. We need more fruit that remains. We need to pray for that. The pattern of the church in the Bible that I see, the pattern of the church that I see in the Bible was they continue in prayer. I see that a lot in the Bible. They continue in prayer. They devoted time and attention and strength to the task of prayer. And that's what I see in the scripture. Just to give you some, some examples. Let me just read to you some examples because I was studying this and I want to know how the churches in the New Testament pray. And this is exactly how they pray. They continue in prayer. I mean, they devoted time and attention and, and, and work in this tax of prayer. I think of uh, Colossians chapter 1. Listen, verse 3. It says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Acts 2.42. And they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sake before God, Verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and my, and, and my perfect that which is lacking in your faith. James chapter 5, verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much. What am I saying? The pattern of the churches in the New Testament was they continue in prayer. They devoted time and attention and strength to the task of prayer. We need to be strong in prayer if we want to be an effective witness. We got to follow the pattern. You know what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18? In verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men are always to pray and not to faint. That's Jesus saying that. Luke 81, we ought to pray. We can't give up. We can't throw in the towel. Keep on praying. People, ask, uh, uh, ask pray. People text me and say, pray for this. I say, I've been praying. And then they text me back and said, I'm still waiting. I say, hey, we'll keep praying until the light breaks through. We keep praying until the light breaks through. Man ought to pray and not to faint. Luke 11.1. 1. It says in Luke 11.1, 1, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, that's Jesus, when he sees, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. You know what really impacted the apostles? Jesus, you have to agree with the scripture that Jesus was the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher that I ever taught. No man spake like him, Amen. Powerful in his, in his parables and his sermon. Powerful. Nobody spake like him. Nobody. But guess what really impacted the apostles more than his preaching? His prayer life. Lord, teach us to pray. They saw he, that he was a praying warrior, Christ. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Look, for Jesus, prayer was not optional. It was the key to his life and ministry. If Jesus felt it necessary to, prior, to prior, prioritize prayer... He made it a priority. How much us who are weakly need to make prayer a priority? Jesus made it a, a number one priority, and he's God. He doesn't, he was tempted like we are yet without sin. We fall into sin all the time. How much more do we need to uh, make prayer a priority? Look, have you ever been 
on an airplane? You were recently. Have you ever been on an airplane? And you know that in the beginning of the flight, while the plane is moving, before the plane takes off, you see the, the flight attendant stands up and start making the announcement, the announcement that absolutely no one listened to, what to do in a case of emergency. Right, Jerry? And nobody's paying attention to what you're saying. Nobody, everybody's reading their own thing. They're, they're listening to music or reading a newspaper while this uh, flight attendant is giving those very important instructions in case of emergency, amen? You know that. She says the oxygen, the oxygen mask will drop, that, will drop down. Put the mask on your face. Breathe normally. All is well. And in all the times that I've been flying, I never saw one of those masks drop down. Thank God, amen? I never saw one of those masks right down, but you know what? It gives me a lot of comfort to know that in case something happened, I know where the mask is at, amen? In case of an emergency, right? But look, the sad part is most of us treat prayer like an oxygen mask. We could go through hours, days, sometimes weeks, without even thinking or talking to God in prayer. We like to know prayer is there and available, just in case our backs are against the wall, then we could yank, pull, and place their mask on our face and begin talking to God. Just like that. You know, prayer is just like an like a oxygen. It's an emergency. And look, Jesus said prayer is not so much like an oxygen mask, but rather like an oxygen itself. Like an oxygen itself is what keeps us alive. Amen? We should be engaging in prayer daily, just like we need oxygen daily. Look, we use prayer like a spare tire when you have a flat tire. That's how we use prayer. Like a spare tire when you have a flat tire. But can I tell you, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Prayer should be our steering wheel, not our spare tire. And that's, how, that's how we ought to treat prayer. Jesus treated very serious priority. We ought to make it a priority. We ought to make it a priority. The first characteristic to be an effective witness is we need to pray purposely and how do you pray? You pray purposely, pray continually with perseverance. Give maximum effort and work in prayer. Continue in prayer. That's how you're going to be an effective witness. We have to be prayer warriors. It's sad that most of us, our prayer life stinks. It's very shallow. How much do you pray today? I know I'm stepping on your toes. I don't live with you, but God lives with you. No wonder we're, 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 we're uh, bent out of shape and we're not strong because we don't have a strong prayer life. Amen? We need to step up our prayer life. Hey, the more, the more trials you, you, you it ought to drive you to your knees. It to drive, trials draw me closer to the Lord. You should do the, the same thing to you. The, so the first characteristic of an effective witness is you got to pray purposely. How do you pray purposely? You pray continually with persevering, continue in prayer. The second characteristic for our praying is to be pray watchfully. That's the second thing we see here, pray watchfully. Look at Colossians 4, 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same. Continue in prayer, watch in the same there. That phrase, it means stay awake. That's what it means, stay awake. Don't fall asleep spiritually. What an amazing thought. You know, I love to sleep. You know that I got the gift of sleeping? I do. I love to sleep. God loves me so much that he gave me the gift, the gift of sleep. Anybody like to sleep too, or is it just me? I love to sleep. Look, maybe one day we should have a sleeping party in the church. We're going to promote, bring your pillows. Everybody bring their pillow. We're going to take a nap during church. Man, I, wonder how, I wonder if this place will get packed, amen? Amen. We're going to have a slumber party. Everybody bring your blankets and your pillow, and we're going to take a nap in church. I wonder how many people will show up. Maybe, we'll, maybe our room will get full. Look, I have the gift of sleep. I don't have any trouble sleeping. I thank God for that. I do have the gift of sleep. By the way, my son Brandon, my younger son, he also had the gift of sleep. I think he beat me to it. But look, the Bible does say in Psalm 127, in verse 2, the last part of verse 2, Psalm 127, verse 2, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. See, God loves me that he gives me, I'm his beloved, the gift of sleep. The gift of sleep. 
But look, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose. To everything there's a season and a time for every purpose. There's a time to sleep and there's a time to stay awake. And when it comes to prayer, God wants us to stay awake. We ought to be alert Christians, amen? God wants us, when it comes to prayer, God wants us to stay awake. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same. In fact, go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, don't lose your spot. Go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. I want you to notice, beginning in verse uh, 36 there. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. This is Matthew 26, verse 36. And said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Verse 37, He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Thus says he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry, wait ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cut pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. By the way, he prayed that three times, Jesus to his heavenly father. He was experiencing, even though that he was God in the human flesh. He still had a, a human body. He still felt sorrow and pain. And Jesus was experiencing the burden of the cross. The human suffering that goes over the cross, and Jesus was just feeling that, that burden, that he was even uh, uh, trying to avoid that suffering and pray to his Father, if it would be possible, Father, let this cup, this suffering on the cross, pass on me. Do we have any, is there an, a, a different option? Three times he prayed. Of course, God said, it is possible. You got to go to the cross. Thank God he did. We won't be saved today, amen? But then he said that, and he, so his heart was very sorrowful. Verse 40, he come unto the disciples and find them what? Asleep. And said unto Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? You couldn't pray one hour with me? And then he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Look, stay awake. When it comes to prayer, we need to be praying alert Christians. We're supposed to pray purposely, continue in prayer. We are praying, so, but we are praying, we should be praying watchfully. Watchfully. That's what we need to be doing. I think it was Sister Diane, if I'm not mistaken, you know, you send those texts to encourage her, and we appreciate that. And you send one, I kind of like it, I said, I'm going to save it. And this is the text that Diane sent me a while back. She said, Satan tries to limit your praying because he knows your praying will limit him. I like that. It's true. Hey, night, no time to pray will make you easy pray for the devil. You don't pray, you're setting yourself for a fall. That's exactly what he said. Watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. Peter, when we don't pray, guess what? We're setting ourselves for a fall to fall into the devil's temptation, to fall into sin. That's exactly what we're doing. No time to pray will make you easy pray for the devil. Dio Moody say this. Dio Moody say this. My friends, if we are going to do a great work for God, we must spend much time in prayer. We have, to, we, we have got to be closeted with God. I like that. We've got to do something for God. We must spend much time in the class of prayer. Somebody say your stress level goes up when your prayer level goes down. You give me somebody who don't pray, he's full of stress. You give, you give me somebody who, whose prayer level is high, his stress level is low. Mark it down. Mark it down. So look. We need to be praying people. Go to Romans chapter 13. God is telling us to stay away spiritually. Wake up. Let's wake up spiritually. Not time to sleep. I got the gift of sleep, but when it comes to praying, I got to stay awake. I got to be an alert Christian. You must be an alert Christian to be an effective witness. Go to Romans chapter 13. Go to Romans chapter 13. We like to use our Bibles here, amen? Anybody love the Word of God here? Romans chapter 13. Look at verse 11. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. It says here in that, Romans 13, 11, it says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. 
Even as when the sun is high in the sky, it's time to get up. The thought is that God's people need to stay awake spiritually. And then he goes on, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Our salvation is nearer now than when we were saved. It could be that Paul could be referring there to the Lord's imminent return. It is closer today than when we were, were saved. And then he goes on verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. What is he saying? We need to wake up. Wait and watch for the Lord's return. Because in any event, heaven is closer today than yesterday, my friend. Christ will come anytime. It's imminent to get us out of here. Praise the Lord. What a mess. And it could happen anytime. Any event, we need to be watchful. Jesus is coming back. And his, nobody knows the time is imminent. And we ought to be watchful. So when he comes, he finds us faithful. In the center of his will, not wavering. And that's what God wants. Verse 13 of Romans 11, he says, let us walk honestly. That means walk properly. As in the day. As in the day. Why? We are children of light. The Bible calls us children of the day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5 calls you and I. We're no longer children of darkness. We walk in the light as he walked in the light. We are children of the day. We are children of the light. That's how we need to walk in the light. And then he says, not in rioting, not in wild parties and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. That, that word chambering and wantonness refers to immoral sexual conduct. I don't have time to build it up, but that's what it's referring to, immoral sexual conduct. Look, let's value sexual purity. Let's value sexual purity. Let's value sexual purity. Maybe you didn't hear me. Let's value sexual purity. We're going to promote that here. You know, I like Carmen when she say, man, I saw that, the map move, the, the mask. <laughs> but look, that's what we need to do. And then he says, not in strife and envy. But then he says, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I believe when you put on Christ, you know what you're doing? You put it on the whole armor of God. When you put on Christ. When you put on Christ, you're clothing yourself in all that Christ is. You, you're put, you put on Christ as Savior, right? Now put him on your daily walk. If you, you put him as your Savior, right? Now put him in your daily walk. Walk like he walked, victoriously. Full of faith. That's what we need to do. And uh, it says make no provision for the flesh. When you put on Christ, when you, when you close yourself with all that Christ is, and you put yourself with the whole armor of God, because that's what it is when you put on Christ, then guess what? You will make no provision for the flesh. You will not make yourself, you will not make it easy for you to fall into temptation and fall into sin. You'll be alert. You'll be awake. You keep your guard up. Just like the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5 eight. Be sober. Wake up, Christian. Be sober and vigilant and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk around seeking who he may devour. Listen, we are in a spiritual warfare. We have a real enemy called the devil. It's not time to sleep. It's time to wake up and be praying Christians. Don't ever underestimate the devil. He'll knock you flat in your face. You got no match for the devil. I have no match for the devil without prayer, without bathing your life in prayer. We have no match for the devil. To be an effective witness, you must pray purposely, continue in prayer. Pray with perseverance. Devote time and attention and strength to the tax of prayer. Pray wisefully. Stay awake. Third characteristic, to be an effective witness, we must, in, in order to pray with a purpose, we must pray with thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, prayer with thanksgiving. That means in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks, my friend. Even bad things that happen to you, give God thanks. He knows what's going on. You don't know, trust him. All things work together for good to them that love God. Because what you call bad, God might say, it's good for you. What you could go, what you call good, God might say, that's not good for you. Let God decide what's good and bad, not you and I. Everything give thanks. To be an effective witness, pray purposely. 
We need to pray continually with perseverance. It means to devote time and attention to the strength, to the, to the task of prayer. We're supposed to pray wisely, stay awake spiritually. We're supposed, number three, pray with thanksgiving and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And then, number four, we, know, we must pray specifically for other needs, for other people's needs. If you notice in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul said, with all praying also for us. No doubt the apostle Paul covered, he covered their prayers. And by the way, you know what? I cover your prayers. And I hope you cover my prayer for you too. We should be covering each other's prayer, amen? There's power in prayer, you're not a prayer, my friend. Don't take prayer lightly. Prayer is powerful because Jesus led by example. He made it a priority, we ought to make it a priority. So Paul made it a priority. He covered, he covered their prayer, prayed for us. But Paul mentioned specific things to pray about. He said, number five, pray that God will open doors to preach the gospel. Pray that God will open doors to preach the gospel. Verse 3, Colossians 4, 3, that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am I also in bonds. You know, the mystery of Christ there, that is, I believe that mystery is revealed to us today. It could be referring to the, it's the gospel of Christ. It's referring to the blood of Christ that was shed at the cross for the whole world. And we must preach that, 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 that gospel, that mystery of Christ that's been revealed to us. Only Jesus saves. Only his precious blood cleanses from all sin. We ought to preach that. Paul did it. In fact, the preaching of the mystery of Christ was the cause of his Paul's imprisonment. He says there, he said, for which I am also in bonds, because he's preaching this mystery of Christ, the gospel. That's what put him in jail. And you know what? It's interesting to me that it's beautiful to notice that Paul does not ask prayer that he might be released from prison. He's in prison. He didn't ask prayer, pray that I'll be released. He just prayed that God will open the door so I could preach the gospel. So look, whatever your circumstances is, whether they're bad, call them bad, Look for an opportunity, whatever you're serving, to get an opportunity to share Christ. Amen? Share Christ wherever you are, whatever your circumstances. His circumstances were not good. And he didn't give him prayer to be released from prison. He said, just pray that God will open the door while I'm here to preach the gospel. That's powerful. That's powerful. You know why? We need to pray for open doors. Let's pray for open doors that God will give us the opportunity to preach the gospel. Let's pray for that. That's, that will be biblical. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Paul, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Acts 4, 17. Acts 4, 27. And when they were come and have gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God has done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentile. What a meaning. Acts 4, 27. They were rehearsing. They had a meeting. Talking about how good God's been, what God has done with us, and how God opened the door, and many came to faith. Many Gentiles came to Christ. Can you imagine, Jared, what a meeting that had to be? A lot of praising God with people getting saved. God did it. God opened the door. You know what? We ought to get excited about getting people saved. Amen? We ought to get excited. People need the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 69, For a great door and effectual is open unto me. How many of you would love an effectual, effective door of opportunity open for you? Don't you want that, an effectual door? But guess what? Be, beware. Beware those who raise your hand because if God's going to open an effective door, the adversaries are going to be there. There are many adversaries. This open door was accompanied by adversaries. God's will, listen, God's will is not free of adversaries and obstacles and problems. Don't interpret that being that just because you're, you're in the midst of, of, of trials and, and trouble, don't think that you are out of God's will. You might be in the center of God's will. Because Paul was in the center of God's will, God opened a door, but there's many adversaries. There's a lot of, any, a lot of obstacles. But I'm going to stay here and I'm going to fight the obstacles. Because I'm going to see victory. I'm going to see miracles. Amen? Amen. And you know what? Don't get scared. Don't get paranoid. When you face trouble and trials, praise God for it. Because God could be opening the door. Just stay there. 
Stay faithful, keep the faith. That's what I see here. And that's what we need to be praying for. Look at Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter 4. If you notice in verse 4, Paul says that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Pray God will use us to manifest the gospel in a clear way so people can understand. I think that's what he's talking about. We need to pray now that God will open the door to preach the gospel, but that when we get the open door, we make sure that we're going to manifest the gospel, we're going to present it clearly so people could understand it, because the devil likes to confuse people. So look, give the gospel presentation, take your time. Don't rush through it just to get a prayer. You explain to them clearly that they're sinners, there's a price for sin, Christ paid all. Even if it takes you an hour, take your time and make it clear so they can understand the gospel. That's what we need to do. Okay? Make sure you're giving a clear presentation of the gospel Christ because people need to hear a clear presentation so they can understand it. And then it says there in verse 5, walk in wisdom towards them that are without. That means walk wisely. To be an effective witness, we must walk wisely. People are watching you. If you want to impact others with the gospel, walk wisely. Walk wisely means to keep doing it faithfully, keep doing it habitually, Walk wisely means live cautiously. Walk beautifully before the outsiders. Walk beautifully before the unsaved world. Make the gospel look attractive. Walk with urgency. Redeeming the time, he says there in verse 5. We must do, take advantage of every opportunity. And this is urgent. People are going to die without Christ. And if you talk to them and cross paths, they might, you don't know, they might be the last day. They're going to give the last breath, and you're going to have blood in your hands. So let's do it with urgency, redeeming the time. And let's live right before our unbelievers. And look at verse 6, last verse there. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to, how to answer every man. Our speech should be seasoned, seasoned with salt. Salt represents purity. Our speech should be honest, pure, without hypocrisy. Our speech should be ready to answer every man. Every man, people might ask you, the Bible talks about that people might ask you of the hope that is in you. And we answer with respect and courtesy. I mean, look, we're supposed to speak graciously. We're not here to argue with people. We're not here to be mean. Look, we must speak graciously. Our speech should always be always gracious, courteous, humble, and Christ-like. I'm not here to argue with people. I'm not here to waste my breath here. You're not interested? I'll move on. Thank you for your time. Here's the gospel try. I'm going to move on somebody who wants to listen. Amen? I, speak, I want to leave the door open for the next soul winner. I'm not going to get bitter and angry. You're not interested between you and God. It's your soul. That's what we need to do. We, our speed needs to be free from gossip and profanity and impurity and lying and bitterness. Look, to put it down this way, to be an effective witness, just to boil it down to three things, with what I just gave you. To be an effective witness, you're supposed to pray right, Walk right and talk right. That's pretty much it. That's the message. To be an effective winner, pray right, walk right, talk right. And that's how we're going to be an effective witness for the Lord. Amen? Stand on our feet. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Thank God for church. Look, I'm motivated. I'm excited to be saved. And look, let's spread the fire. Don't be a deadbeat for Jesus this new year. Don't be a deadbeat for Jesus. Let's be a fireball for Christ. Amen? Catch the fire. You know how you're going to catch that fire? Spend time in the Word every day. Spend time in sweet hour of prayer. I'll give you some fire. Amen? So let's, uh, let's pray. Father, use the message, dear God, how to be an effective witness. Lord, use it. I pray that, uh, Lord, you touch our hearts with the word. Lord, may we pray right. May we walk right. May we talk right. That's the message. Lord, as, as, as the piano play, uh, I like to give the invitation, amen, those who want to respond to the message. So as the music play, the piano play, if you need to respond to the invitation, the altar is open for you.